I understand people that become atheists because of suffering. I've been to Auschwitz many times and I've wept every time. What do you say? But the atheist root has problems. Because if you say, well, that's just how the world is. Richard Dawkins does this. The world's just what you'd expect it to be. If it bottled, there's no good, no evil, no justice. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. That's his view. But half a minute, if there's no good and no evil, why are you talking about the problem of evil and pain? Where do you get the concept of good and evil from if you deny the existence of God? And I want to go down that route because I spent a lot of time in Russia. And for many of my Russian friends, Dostoevsky was almost a prophet when he pointed out if God doesn't exist, everything is permissible. He didn't mean that atheists couldn't behave well. Of course they can. I believe that all men and women are made in the image of God as moral beings, and of course they can behave. What he meant was there's no rational justification for morality if there's no God. Just as I believe, and I've explained to you tonight, why I think there's no rational justification for science if there's no God. This is a parallel thing. I want to say really, really quick here that I know some people in the comments section are probably jumping to say, well, wait a second, there can be objective morality without God. But what they mean is that people within a particular culture at a particular time can agree on what is right or wrong. But what they can't say is why that agreement should be a fixed standard that persists against time. If evolution is true, that is an ever moving target. And there's no good reason to conclude that that target won't lead to places that are heinous and immoral, like it already has in the 20th century under the Nazi regime, for example. Um, there's a lot more that could be said, but let's get back to Linux. So the atheist view has huge problems. And of course, what does it solve? The one thing it doesn't solve is the pain or the evil still there. So what do we do? Well, let me tell you very briefly what I do. We've all asked the question, surely if there's a good God who's all powerful, there'd be no evil. So he can't be good or he can't be powerful. You've all heard that, haven't you? And you've all spent hours like I did as a student going through the night. Surely a good God would, could, might, should, all this kind of thing. Have any of you ever come to a satisfactory conclusion after that? No. Not one. I've never met one. Do you know why? It's very simple to see why. Because when we finish the discussion, we're faced with beauty and barbed wire in our world. Or beauty and bombs. It's a mixed picture. That's our problem. And any explanations that don't face that just don't wash. They don't work. So how do we cope with beauty and bombs? That's putting it very bluntly. But you know, if we don't face these things, we can't solve the problem of if God was this and this and this and this, then surely he would. The fact is, we got beauty and bombs. I'm a pure mathematician, and one of the few things I've learned from that is, if you can't solve one question, change the question. So here's my question. Granted that it's beauty and bombs, is there any evidence anywhere in the universe that there's a God that you could trust with it? Now that's a big question, ladies and gentlemen. I believe there is. See, at the heart of Christianity is not only a resurrection, but a cross. Now come with me, you might find this difficult, but I often say to audiences, look, at least listen to what Christianity says before you reject it. Like I listen and spent my life listening to atheists and Hindus and, uh, and so on and so forth, arguing their case. At least listen. The claim is that the man on the cross was God incarnate. That's a colossal claim. But come with me. If he was, it raises a very deep question. What's God doing on a cross? Well, at the very least, and I've often sat beside people who are suffering intensely, and some of you may be right now. 
and said, at least that tells us that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. That's a window, ladies and gentlemen. That's a window, but it opens. Because if that were the end of the story, there'd be nothing more to be said. But the resurrection now tells us that death is not the end. And when the early Christian apostles went out into the world and preached the resurrection, one of the main points they made was, it guarantees there's going to be a final judgment. That's a marvelous thing. Justice will be done. The women and children that screamed their way into eternity in Auschwitz, does God know about that? Of course he does. Now this is a huge issue, and I, I almost hesitate to compress it like this. But ladies and gentlemen, the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ now become a huge focus for something absolutely colossal. Not only does the cross mean that God has drawn near to us in our suffering, it's much deeper than that. If Christianity is true, Christ took upon himself all those things that cause suffering. All the mess that I've made in my life that's caused other people to suffer. And sometimes I thought it was wonderful. My snide remarks, my hate, my jealousy and all this kind of stuff. He's taken them upon himself so that he can forgive me. Science has nothing to say about love. It's nothing to say about forgiveness. But the biggest thing that I need as a human being is forgiveness. Is there forgiveness? Human guilt is one of the biggest problems in the universe. Now, as I say, this isn't our topic for tonight, but you did ask me to say something about it. And uh, what I would leave you with this. I do not know of any window into this hard question that bypasses the cross. But what I do know is that millions of people have stood at that cross and by trusting Christ and receiving him into their lives, they've received new life. You know, so often at these meetings in science, people say at the end, and I'm finishing with this, they say, you know, you're a scientist. Aren't you an idiot, really? Because sitting there talking about Christianity, Christianity is not testable. Who told you that? Christianity is testable, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when you watch young people who are dependent on drugs or narcotics, and then you meet them six months later, and they're free, and you say, what happened to you? Where's the radiance come from? Well, and this is the way they will put it. Well, actually, I, I found out about Jesus Christ and I trusted him and I've got this new power and I, I watched the TV program last Sunday, I think it was, at home. And it was about narcotic dependence and, and older people and this house that looked after him run by Christians. And somebody said, what does this house mean to you? And the man said, you see that door into the house? I walked through there and I got saved. Saved in the sense of his life saved and made meaningful. Why? Because they told him about Christ. You see, I, as you see, I, I'm pretty old. I'm probably pretty near the end of my life. But I have seen again and again and again and again and again transformation in life. And when you see two and two make four thousands of times, you begin to believe that two and two make four. What's it got to do with? It's got to do with Christ. That's the evidence. If that wasn't there, I would quit. But it is there. And I've lived with Christ for over 60 years. And in my family and with my wife, we put it to the test again and again. Now you say that's all subjective, but in the end, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. If there was no evidence of that kind, there would be absolutely no reason to believe. This last point that John Lennox is making is so important because what he is pointing at here is that there actually is a test 
a testable nature to Christianity. There's a testable nature in the historical evidence surrounding the resurrection, but more than that, there's a testable nature to Christianity in the millions and millions and millions of people whose lives have been changed by Jesus Christ in actuality. People who are all together saying, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I was once in darkness, but now I'm in marvelous light. I know that language sounds poetic, but the point is this. People across time and across culture are independently saying that they have actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and have been saved. What does that look like? It means freedom. It means liberation. It means that things that you were once powerless to overcome in your life, you have now actually been given power through the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome. It means that you actually can look at this dramatic change that has happened in your life story and say the impetus for the good change was Jesus Christ. And what's so crazy, so to kind of put this in scientific language, since I know that atheists and agnostics like that, the claims, sort of the hypothesis here, are actually in the New Testament. Jesus himself says, I have come to give you life and life abundantly. Jesus himself says that, um, that come all ye who are heavy laden unto me and I will give you rest. And then we see throughout the past 2,000 years, those hypotheses basically ringing true as, again, people from t different times, different cultures, individual people, it, without the technology to even be able to collude together and say, hey, let's pretend that the change agent in our life story was Jesus. Hey, yeah, let's, let's get on the phone and let's all do this grand conspiracy theory where we all pretend like Jesus Christ changed our life. That's not even nearly as, as realistic or plausible of a solution as, wait a second, there's actually there's actually something to this claim that Christians are making that he, Jesus, in his resurrection is still working and the gospel message when believed actually bears fruit in people's lives. That's a very, very extreme, dramatic and audacious thing for Christians to claim and yet that's exactly what we do claim. It's not just, yeah, I believe in this religion or my parents are Christian so I'm Christian or we are part of this religious system. It's no, I actually have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I was once powerless and now I've been empowered by him. I was once blind and now I can see. There's liberation at the core of the Christian message and that liberation comes through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So this is something I just want to put to you guys in this way because I know a lot of you are really, really into science and really into empiricism. Look at this like a, look at this like a math problem or, or a science equation. What's the best solution for the dramatic amount of actual changed lives that have happened over the last 2000 years? Just something to think about. With that being said, I hope you guys like this video. I love John Lennox and I love the way that he talks about suffering and the suffering Christ in the face of suffering, offering hope and redemption to humanity through this beautiful cross that is like an addition sign being given to the entire human species. Um, always love hearing your comments and thoughts, so um, definitely feel free to join the conversation in the comment section. I'll try to respond to what I can, as I'm sure additional questions and conversations will flow out of that. With all this being said, I hope you guys enjoy this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, bye.